What is that? A new SpaceX Super Heavy Booster segment spotted. Is this the first next-gen Starship booster? Starship 31 gets its engines. How long till it flies? SpaceX's groundbreaking Polaris Dawn mission is a go, but is it safe after Falcon 9's failure? My name is Felix, welcome to What About It, let's dive right in. Today's tour of the craziest rocket development in human history starts over at SpaceX's Starbase launch site. Or should we actually start calling it Build Site 2? SpaceX has been doing a lot of construction here and the name seems to fit well. They are building the future of spaceflight in this very spot. We knew that Starship Launch Tower B would go up extremely quickly compared to the first because the internals of each module had already been installed. SpaceX is way more organized on this second Starship Tower build. However, I don't think any of us were ready for how fast it's actually going up. A few days ago we witnessed yet another significant milestone as SpaceX rolled the fourth tower module from the Sanchez site to the launch site. Shortly after, the fourth module was hooked to the gigantic Demek 8800-1 crane. It was then lifted into place on top of the third module of Tower B. Four down, five to go. With this module now on top, Starship Launch Tower B is already over halfway to its final 9 module height. Wait, if it's supposed to be 9 modules tall but has 4 modules stacked, how is that over half? Well, it's already over half because the final two modules are smaller in size to allow for easier stacking and the base of the tower is roughly the size of a module all on its own. This speed is breathtaking and shows how fast SpaceX is capable of working. The first tower module had only been placed on the 11th, that was just 14 days ago at the time of this episode's release. SpaceX's speed is unmatched in the aerospace industry and this is just one more example of that. It's even more surprising when you realize that Module 4 was also one of the two modules that had just been transported from Cape Canaveral a couple of weeks ago. However, despite their incredible speed, the deadline for stacking the first six modules is fast approaching. This deadline is from when SpaceX filed for a determination of no hazard with the FAA, which is required when working with tall structures that could pose a hazard to aircraft. Yup, the tower is that tall. This filing was for the crane and SpaceX stated that the first six modules of the tower would be completed by the 27th before the crane was lowered and its height increased. Tick tock SpaceX, tick tock. If SpaceX is on schedule for that, we may even see the fifth module at the launch site by the time you're watching this, perhaps even already stacked on top of module 4. If you want to get even more info and even faster, I suggest you take a good look at Y+, our second channel. While you won't find my commentary there, you will find regular updates of what we weren't able to fit into our episodes. Indigo and Jonathan, our Y+, team are doing an incredible job over there. A link to Y+, can be found in the description. So this brand new Starship launch tower isn't the only tower at the launch site, however. We also have the original, and although its younger brother is taking some of the spotlight, Tower A still has quite a lot of excitement coming. And with this next launch coming, excitement is guaranteed. But it's not the launch that most people are looking forward to, but what comes after. Launch number 5 will be the first attempt at a booster catch, where the gigantic Mechazilla catch arms grab the Starship booster out of mid-air when it returns from its trip to space. Yep, you heard that right. For those who haven't been keeping up with SpaceX's activities, that probably sounds like a bit of a crazy sentence. But that means that instead of landing the booster on a concrete landing pad or a drone ship as with Falcon 9, SpaceX will instead attempt landing the booster on these giant metal arms. Right now they're only used to stack the booster and ship onto the launch pad. But why would SpaceX do that? The drone ship works fine, right? Well, it all comes down to math. Adding full reusability compared to Falcon 9, which is only partly reusable, adds more weight to the rocket. A heat shield on the ship, for example. SpaceX decided to remove the need for landing legs to save weight on the booster. Okay, it still sounds crazy, but hopefully it will make more sense now. To accomplish this seemingly insane maneuver, SpaceX must ensure that all of Mechazilla's systems work properly. So SpaceX performed a series of tests on a specially designed test tank called B14.1. 
After those tests, it appeared that SpaceX found some flaws in the design as teams were seen removing pieces of the shock absorbers. Something may have been damaged from the test or possibly from the recent static fire Starship Booster 12. But it's more likely to be upgraded for the first catch attempt, which is just around the corner. Excitement is definitely guaranteed. With the future of Starship Stage 0, which includes the entire launch infrastructure covered, let's move to the build site to discuss the future of Stages 1 and 2. Let's start off in the high bay, where only one vehicle currently resides. I'm of course talking about the brand new Block 2 Starship, Ship 33. Everything learned from the first four flights is integrated into this massive upgrade step of the entire rocket. As you may remember, Ship 30, the next Starship to fly, was recently rolled out of the high bay to Massey's. More engine testing is on the menu, which means that its work stand is currently vacant. Ship 33, however, remains. We've not seen any more major sections of the prototype rolled out, but we did see this. This is the payload bay door to the new prototype. It covers the opening in the payload bay, which will be used to release Starlink satellites. Yes. As we talked about in our previous episode, Ship 33's heavily upgraded payload dispenser bay was recently spotted near Mega Bay 2. But this is only part of the system for deploying Starlink satellites. The other is this new payload bay door. It was seen rolling into the high bay and is very likely for Ship 33 it will complete the PES dispenser. Once these are installed, we will likely see more sections rolled to the high bay for stacking below the pre-existing nose cone and payload sections. Step by step, a new starship is created. Now that we've looked at the high bay, let's examine the larger mega bay, where SpaceX is planning to ramp up mass production of starships. But before I tell you about that, we've also looked into our channel metrics and over 2 million returning monthly viewers who have not yet subscribed. Help us improve the channel even further by double checking that you've hit that subscribe button so you don't miss our updates. And while you're at it, give us a like and become a wise supporter for exclusive SpaceX updates. With it, you get access to daily Starbase photo galleries, including satellite, aerial and ground photos of SpaceX's progress and countless other extras on top. And no matter how much you decide to give, everyone gets the same supporter content and access. You decide what you want to give. Thank you very much. So back to Mega Bay 1. It has become quite tricky to see inside ever since SpaceX installed the large door to the front. However, recently we did see something entering this Mega Bay, something you might find very interesting. This is the aft section of Booster 15 and it has been sitting here for quite some time. This section houses all the plumbing that sends cryogenic propellants to Super Heavy's 33 Raptor engines. However, as it rolled to the high bay, we could see the vehicle's header tank. The header what? These hold cryogenic liquid oxygen and are the source of propellant during the landing burn, so the colder temperatures on the outer tanks don't depressurize the vehicle. This is opposed to the purpose of the ship's header tanks, which are used due to the excessive movement of the propellants during the famous Starship belly flop maneuver. During flight, it flips from vertical to horizontal and back to vertical, and it needs to start its engines while doing so. That's what the Starship header tanks are for. Not so on the booster. Because re-entry heats up the booster on descent. As it reaches the lower atmosphere and cools down, the tanks become much colder, and such a drastic change in temperature causes the propellant to shrink. This makes burning propellant much harder, which makes using the header tanks much safer. But what's odd is that these smaller tanks are connected to the outside almost like a hat. At first these confused us, but we have a hypothesis as to why they are there. It may be that these tanks will hold gas such as helium or nitrogen for pressurization. When you rapidly empty a rocket's tanks because you're running powerful engines at full thrust, you want to add something back into the main tanks, otherwise sour lemon drops. <laughs> This would be the same as Falcon 9, which fills the tanks with helium as the propellant runs out to maintain constant pressure. It is necessary to pressurize the tanks so that they don't buckle as fuel runs out. Kind of like when you suck all the water out of a water bottle without letting any air in and it crinkles. <laughs> you don't want that happening to your rocket at all. Starship faces this by partly burning its existing cryogenic propellant until it becomes a gas and expands, which is less complex. Our theory, however, is that this form of autogenous pressurization was likely the root cause of the failures on Flight 3. 
It's likely that issues with this came because of the sheer size of Starship's tanks. This means that these little tanks could help eliminate issues that have continued to plague them. It's also possible that this new way to pressurize the tanks is only for the headers and the rest of the booster will remain under autogenous pressure. This is all pure speculation, but it would make sense, especially for the booster section given its size and propellant capacity. It's also unclear if these tanks have been on previous flights such as Flight 4. If our theory is correct, that could be the reason for Flight 4's great success. There is one other thing these tanks could be for. They could act as a hotfix so that this booster can support the larger Block 2 starships, such as holding more propellant. This might be essential since Booster 15 was originally supposed to be a Block 1 booster, but now it must act as an interim booster, kind of like a Block 1B. This scenario seems less likely to me, but it can't be completely ruled out. What do you think? Are these new tanks for pressurization and is SpaceX done with autogenous pressurization? Is SpaceX making up for the lower capability of Booster 15 or do they simply want to give Booster 15's head a hat? Tell us down below in the comments. Now you may be wondering what the fate of this section will be. Well, it will likely be stacked beneath Booster 15 soon. This will likely mark the end of LOX tank stacking for this prototype, which means that methane tank stacking will soon commence. Progress. We've talked a lot about what's going on at the old high bay and mega bay, but what about the newest bay, mega bay 2? Well, after the test tank was rolled to Massey's last week, the only hardware in mega bay 2 is ship 31 or Sparky. This ship underwent cryogenic proof testing on July 3rd to ensure its systems were ready for engine installation and flight. To accomplish this, the ship was fueled with cryogenic liquid nitrogen and had hydraulic rams pressed up against where the engines would be installed to simulate the forces of a launch. This test is important to catch any mistakes early on that could lead to problems later on. This ship is a good example of that as it had a problem during its last cryoproof test. A pipe broke causing an electrical fire. That is why this ship is nicknamed Sparky. After this latest cryoproof test, Ship 31 was rolled back to the build site for checks before its six Raptor engines could be installed. It appears that Ship 31 passed all of its checks, so you know what that means. It's time to release the Raptors. On the 22nd and 23rd, we saw all six of Sparky's engines rolled over to Mega Bay 2 and likely installed shortly after. Two vacuum engines and one sea level engine were installed on the 22nd before the last vacuum engine. The other two sea level engines were installed on the 23rd. We also caught the serial numbers from many of these engines. All of them are in the 300 range with the highest serial number being 391. SpaceX gives each manufactured Raptor engine a number, so looking at these numbers gives an important clue as to how advanced they are. With all six engines now installed, Ship 31 is ready for its next testing regime. This will include a series of smaller engine tests ending with a full static fire over at Massey's on the new static fire stand. But before Ship 31 can do that, the static fire stand needs to be empty. Right now there is another ship there. So let's check out what's happening with Ship 30 over at Massey's. After it was rolled over to Massey's last week, it was placed over the flame trench and hooked up to the quick disconnect, which fuels the ship during tests. As a recording, Ship 30 has not been static fired, however it's likely to happen soon if it hasn't already. Ship 30 will be the next ship to fly and the first ship with the redesigned heat shield. This includes an ablative layer beneath as a backup and stronger heat tiles on top. SpaceX has had problems in the past with tiles falling off after static fire, so it will be interesting to see how Ship 30's new heat shield tiles do. After this static fire, Ship 30 should be completely ready for Flight 5. You got this, Ship 30, we are rooting for you. Since we're over at Massey's test range, let's also check out the other test subject here, the new Booster Block 2 test tank. This test tank was rolled to Massey's last week around the same time as Ship 30. However, unlike Ship 30, SpaceX's plan for this tank remains a bit of a mystery. It was loaded into the new Can Crusher 2.0. That Can Crusher, as we call it, basically squishes Starship prototypes to see how they do under structural stress. From what we can observe, the tank appears to be a structural test pathfinder for future Block 2 boosters, which we talked about earlier. It appears this tank will be tested similarly to previous tanks in the can crusher with pistons pulling down on a lid. 
The only question remaining is why does it need the extra rings? Why make it so tall? It is also possible that the test SpaceX is conducting on this tank will not require these new rings, but we'll have to wait and see. Now let's take a quick break from all the news this week and take a look at a groundbreaking upcoming spaceflight mission. If you've been watching our channel for a while, the name Polaris will be no stranger to you. Let's see if you're missing some info. Polaris, founded by billionaire Jared Isaacman, is a whole series of crewed spaceflight missions. This isn't Jared's first step into space exploration either. He and three others were the main payload of the Inspiration4 mission too. The mission took place back in 2021 and featured the first launch of an all-civilian crew. First time we had regular old dudes and gals on a capsule to orbit. That mission went to a low Earth orbit and stayed there for a couple of days. Awesome, cute, epic, but what's next? Enter Polaris Dawn. The first mission in the Polaris program promises to be way more important. The plan for this flight is to fly to a much larger high Earth orbit. This Crew Dragon will go up and then stay there, undocked from anything just like on Inspiration4. The difference on this mission is the inclusion of a hatch. During Inspiration4, Crew Dragon Resilience simply sported a glass dome where its docking hatch once was. However, for Polaris Dawn, it underwent a major overhaul. Resilience has now been outfitted with a hatch which can seal in air or be opened to allow access to space. The goal of this mission is no other than the first all-civilian spacewalk. No NASA astronauts, no Russian cosmonauts, regular old dudes and gals spacewalking. People like you and me. Yep, that is right, we're coming to an age where a private company has all the means to organize a spacewalk with everything needed for it. Rocket, capsule, suit, astronauts, all SpaceX. The four crew members are Jared Isaacman, Commander, Scott Petit, Pilot, Sarah Gillis and Anna Manon, Mission Specialists. Out of those four, two, Jared and Sarah, will leave the spacecraft and complete a spacewalk one after the other. The interesting thing about this spacewalk is that all members of the mission will be in an unpressurized capsule. In this situation, resilience will act somewhat like a giant airlock. The spacecraft will slowly be depressurized while the crew is suited up in their SpaceX-designed EVA suits. After this, the hatch will be opened. Scott and Anna will support the spacewalk from inside resilience while Jared and Sarah will complete science and work outside the spacecraft. This will then conclude with the crew re-entering the spacecraft and pressurizing it afterward. Due to the wide orbit, this mission will mark the highest any human has flown since Apollo 17 in 1972. This mission sounds like pure sci-fi. How many years until it launches? Well, the mission could launch as soon as next month, so mark your calendars. The launch date was originally set to July 29th, however a recent Falcon 9 mishap in which the upper stage of a Starlink launch decided to turn into a giant popcorn delayed it a bit. The date is now unannounced, but I imagine it will be swiftly announced as soon as Falcon 9 is back online. This flight will usher in a new commercial crewed spaceflight era and pave the way for future Polaris missions. The next Polaris mission will be very similar to this one, however Polaris 3 will be the first crewed flight of the Starship rocket, which means it's important for this mission to go very smoothly. It will be exciting to see what new possibilities Polaris brings to the table. We are proud of the entrepreneurs who sacrifice their hard-earned time and money to make missions like these a reality. Thank you, Rook and team. That's it for today. Remember to smash that like button. Subscribe for more awesome content. This is what fuels the algorithm and it helps us immensely. Check out our epic shirts in your favorite Space Nerd store. A link is in the description. And if you want to train your space IQ even further, watch this video next to continue your journey. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again in the next episode. We algorithm. Huh? Look at this. I love it. As soon as I start calling my rockets precious, you need to, by the way, uh, call somebody. And yes, K-pop capable. God damn it! Quiet, my little children.